I'm going to read to you from a novel I've been working on for a while, and my agent is going to beat me up if I don't give it to her soon. And uh, it's called, There's a Man Going Around Taking Names. And uh, I don't really have to tell you much about this because it starts at the beginning. I'll just say that it is a, uh, it's a lot, I like long things. I don't know what's wrong with me. I, it takes place in 1970 and 1990. Um, and yeah, I don't really think I have to, this is from the, the introduction. It's called uh, Only the Dead No Chapel Hill. <laughs> Are you experienced? The body lies like a half-eaten pork chop, or the butcher's work partially done. It has achieved a degree of repose impossible in a living person. The posture is complete, but it knows no peace. The atmosphere is not clinical, as we would expect, but rather like that of a garage used for storage. None of the tools look familiar, though their grim purpose is apparent. Saw, knife, pincer, rod. A leg is missing here. A head there. In some, their innards are outward. We see their hearts, their lungs. In one, the intestine. In another, the legs have been completely removed. These bodies belong mostly to black men, but what truly disturbs the eye, what causes the greatest unease in the viewer is the living, not the dead. About the faces of these young white men lab, clad in lab coats, arranged about the bodies and poises akin to those from wedding portraits is a look of triumph, a certain childlike glee. These several photographs are of medical students at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, later day Southern Galens, delving into the inner mysteries of the human body, seekers after knowledge. The horror of their ghoulish display is clearly lost upon them. They are blithe in their bloody research. These photographs were taken in the gay 1890s, 1892 to be exact, and charisma was a new thing in photography. Suddenly, the subjects were self-conscious, where once people stared the camera down, as if a demon lurked in the brownie box in fear of their very souls being snatched away, a piece of them stolen, they were now powerfully aware of being made into a portrait, a snapshot shot for time everlasting. But one cannot help but focus on the body and think, who was that? Why is he there being carved and dissected and studied instead of put under the ground with solemnity and ceremony? Do these young men, boys really, innocent despite the beer and the skirt chasing, writing letters home begging for money, dreaming at night of future wives, future children, future homes, future bank accounts, do they consider this specimens? Or has the holy pursuit of science already trumped the ancient codes? To be sure, these pre-Hippocratian practitioners were intent upon their craft in order to mend little sissy in Deep Gap or Mr. Fitz Edmonds back in Body Creek. Their work is serious, necessary, laudable, and who among us would like a physician who has never held a heart in his hand, who has not actually seen where the spleen slumbers, where the liver cavorts? Who knows not how the brain curves in the palm of the hand, nor been eyewitness to the mysteries of the kidney? Rumor has it that black people mysteriously disappear in Chapel Hill. 
Some believe they are kidnapped to Memorial Hospital for experience, experiments, fresh corpses. Over the years, scores of families in West Chapel Hill and Carborough have seen their menfolk up and disappear on them. To this day, these families swear their loved ones were snatched up by doctors from the university where their bodies were used for victim on Frankenstein-like experiments. But of course, there is no proof. Sometimes men just up and leave without reason, without words. Where shall we begin this tale? In the old farmhouse, two and a half weeks after the abductions, in the time of frayed nerves and anxious sweat, the boys sealed away in their room, slumbering from sheer boredom and heat, the Indian strumming away on his national steel resnophonic guitar, an old polyrhythmic, polyrhythmic Django Reinhardt tune taught to him by a horny traveling salesman way back on a snowy North Dakota night, the idiot intent upon an arcane counting exercise that only he understands involving a vast collection of dead leaves, rocks, and spoons. The ex-Black Panther lost in her copy of Jung's Memories, Dreams, Reflections. And the ringleader, the latter-day wizard, the existential lover, the mastermind of this motley crew of flower children off somewhere in the night. His comings and goings now more frequent now more lengthy, lengthy, leading to discussion and to argument. Trust me, he tells them. There are arrangements to be made. Don't worry. Don't worry, asks the Indian. How the hell are we supposed to don't worry, man? You got us up in all this mess and you just disappear, vanish, don't tell us squat. Everything is under control, man. Everything is copacetic, dig? The ex-Black Panther says little, only eyeing this man intently, this man she once thought of as a brother, this man who has led her into the deepest shit of her life, this man whom she is no longer certain she ever understood, even back in Frisco when they dreamed out loud of incendiary insurrections and outlandish acts of terrorism, civil disobedience, and Marxist revolt. But arms akimbo, icy stare fixed, clearly broadcasting to him the sense that she is near her tether's end, soon to go freaky on his narrow monkey behind. And she merely says, hmm. The idiot rocks as the tension mounts. He dislikes it when they fight. They've fought so rarely before. He longs for the days before. Before they came to this hot place, before they became so serious, before they took the boys. Or at least this is how I have always imagined it. This is the house that Elihu built. Where? Holly Ridge, North Carolina. When? Late summer, 1970. Why? Because outside the mountains to the west, in the east of the state, Holly Ridge is the very definition of nowhere. There on the edge of the Holly Shelter Swamp, the mouth of the Cape Fear River, home of ospreys and brown pelicans, snowy egrets and white ibis, of oyster catchers and blue heron, the densest of old growth on the very verge of the very Atlantic, home former home to pirates and blockade runners and lost Spanish gold. Dead men's tales to tell, not too far away, once upon a time, slaves hauled water from the sea in buckets to Sloop Point Plantation, up to the salt works there. In those tight, warring days, a bushel of corn, salt was worth a bushel of corn. This swampy land had seen better days when Camp Davis purred in the swamp with the engines of World War II. Well, that was 16 years before. In 1970, 